Kia ora katoa to the NBR Fano and welcome to another edition of Te Ohanga Māori Column, focusing on the Māori economy and Māori business issues. Today I have the privilege of seeing Guy Te Kiniwi Royal in the flesh in our Auckland studio after his participation in the Oceania 2035 conference this week. Hi Guy. Kia ora, kia ora, So this week you've written about Māori access to capital again. You sort of you wrote about this in early September and said that you'd give us a part two looking at the concept of a Māori bank and that's what you've done. So um, before we sort of get into some of the options that you're talking about in the column, perhaps you can give me a bit of history about you know, the concept of a Māori bank going quite far back, I imagine. Yeah, yeah well, interestingly, you know, uh, because banks have been around for quite a while now and in, 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 uh, in the kind of modern period, the last couple of hundred years, and then uh, even in 1886 there was a, a bank established by then, the the Māori King Tafio. Uh It was really almost like a trading bank for helping a lot of the trade activity that was going on at the moment. They, at that time, Waikato uh, tribe had a fleet of ships that they were constantly sending back and forth with filled with potatoes and kumara and all sorts of other stores that would be looking after a lot of miners in Victoria as well as, as the growing population in Sydney. And so a banking system was actually needed just to help with that trade. Wow. And uh, that sort of obviously didn't perhaps last through the New Zealand wars and, and other um, things that happened through, uh, I suppose, disenfranchisement at that point, but uh, then sort of raised its head again in, in more recent years. Yeah, you know, like a number of things that fell away mm. when under, a, under an intense war and scrutiny and issues. Uh, and so it did take a long time uh, uh, before we kind of saw any more financial institutions raise their head, for, particularly for the Māori sector. Uh, but a couple of came there, and the Māori trustee had a lending kind of facility for it. And there were a number of kind of smaller groups that were doing some lending to, to Māori organisations, but they tended to be pretty narrow in focus and pretty shallow in depth. The, the ability to lend was was pretty small. Yeah. So in your last column, you talked about you know the difficulty um, with, I suppose the the traditional banks that we have here in New Zealand uh, giving lending to some Maori, um, you know things like security over the land that is really held closely by a lot of Maori organisations. They don't necessarily want that to be within the within the purview of of the banks. Um, so what are some of the issues here with actually creating a, a Maori bank? Why haven't we seen it so far? Yeah, yeah. So. Um the, the calls for Māori Bank have been a, around for a while. Um, they are driven from a couple of reasons. One uh, is the difficulty of, of financing previously uh, off you know, multiply owned land. Mm. But really the, in, in later years, the call's been driven primarily because of people seeing the low rates of housing uh, for Māori. You know, I think we're in Māori around 23% compared to a national average of almost 50, 50 plus. So there's clearly some structural issue going on here. Um, the problem is, is that trying to use some sort of financing approach model to fix, which is kind of fundamentals in housing, is a very tricky proposition. To build a bank is quite difficult. Uh, the first one is you need a lot of scale. Mm. Simply, simply to be, if you want to become a registered bank and have all the banking services, you have to get through what's required under the Reserve Bank, which is all about really protecting you know, the, the customer base and to make sure that you're going to be stable, you're not going to fall over and lose people money. The second component is you then have to have enough money then to lend out as well. And that takes a lot. And if you think about it, Māori customer base, if you're only looking after the Māori sector, it's not a giant sector to look after. And it's going to be, the margins on it are going to be really tricky. Mm. Probably not good enough for really most commercial Māori enterprises to invest into. And I think a third kind of biggest issue we have with it is if you're trying to address a housing issue, by simply making it easier to borrow some more money to fund already overpriced houses, which you on a relatively low income are then purchasing, and then you're left with a debt to manage going forward. I don't think we're serving that population well by by creating that as as an issue. I think we're better off looking at housing supply cost, the, the availability of housing. Those are more fundamental levers to address that issue. Okay. Yeah, so but you have given some alternative options to a, a, a Māori bank and including um, sort of white labelling some 
um, I suppose some some foreign financial services, perhaps, and partnering with Maori uh, on the ground here in New Zealand. Run me through some of the options that you've that you've talked about. Yeah, so the white label's been around for an hour, it's kicked around. Um, there's been a few little trials around it. Um, the reality is that there seems to be more and more banking services that are now being made available from offshore into the retail market. They're still kind of narrow, uh, but there are a number of app-based services at the moment that people are, are banking with, which are primarily offshore-based, but because of the ability around electronic transfers and the ability of digital digital currencies and a whole lot of other things, it means people can kind of almost manage their personal fares banking systems without having to resort to any of the sort of big, large retail banks here. Um, and, and you could think about it that there's you could potentially white-label uh, one so sort of service where all the machinery, all the systems, everything's built off, it's offshore, but maybe it's branded under a tribe and it's able to deliver kind of cheap services to, the, to their own tribes. Mm-hmm. It'll be a kind of a package of, of, of financial services to them. So there's, there's, one, of the, there's one like that. Um, there's also now sorts of those with sort of larger balance sheets are starting to finance groups inside themselves. So Naitahu is a perfect example where the various hapu groups that make up Naitahu are wanting to do regional development in their regions and they need fine, you know, money to, to – they need some debt financing to do some sort of large project that might employ a bunch of their own people. Um, they go internally and then they and then they borrow from the parent and off their balance sheet, obviously, at much lower cost. Uh, and so that option is available only obviously, – obviously only available to those ones who've got a decent balance sheet to play against. Sure. And then the third one is, which I've kind of thrown in there, which has been kicked around by a number of people before. It's nothing new. Uh, I think everyone was kind of sitting and watching in, around Kiwi Bank. Uh, Kiwi Bank's quite an interesting play. It's it's the fifth biggest retail bank in New Zealand. Um, it's the only one uh, out of those out of the top out of those top five that is New Zealand owned. The government has just recently acquired back off the Holdings Co, which originally had ACC and the Super Fund investing into it. So now. Under the under the crown balance sheet, it really hasn't changed much. It's just around, moving around who actually is holding it. Uh, but Kiwi Bank has managed to become what I call the you know it was the the costly child of the New Zealand Post when it first started, and there was a lot of moaning and groaning. If people recall, about why are we propping up a silly bank? What's the point of all of this? To a interesting turnaround now, where basically it's the saviour of NZ Post and the revenue maker. For that, as they've seen the rest of their business fall away, Kiwi, Kiwi Bank has been a star, and they've been, their four percent increase again in profit in year on year. Um, I, th- I think it's about 126 mil profit as a as a as a company, um, as a bank. Um, they're a great opportunity. They're in New Zealand. They're aligned with Māori interest, long term controlled for a long term op- uh, New Zealand benefit. Um, they're no, no, they're not part of the six billion profit that's going off annually offshore from taken out of New Zealand consumers' pockets and basically handed over to Australian shareholders. Mm. It's a, it's an attempt to kind of stymie at least that flood of money, mm. reinvest it back into New Zealand. And I think for there's an opportunity for Māori, particularly uh, maybe some of the larger iwi, to potentially invest into it. If the governments are happy to open it up, that way you would have uh, you know the ability to access a, 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 a banking finance institution and have that on your books as, a, as an asset. It will allow you to have some influence over policy, have some influence around lending policy. You could demand more innovation in the lending models, and perhaps we could address some of the issues that I raised in my first article, um, potentially through a Kiwi Bank. Uh, it's a it's a it's an opportunity. Who knows where they go? And I would have thought other long term generational institutions might like KiwiSaver funds might want to invest as well. Mm. Yeah, well, there's some good options there. It'd be interesting to see if any or all of them uh, come to fruition. But kia ora for bringing that up, guy. Cheers. Kia ora. <laughs>